Well, welcome to Epic Church. Go ahead and stand up. For those of you in the lobby, come on in. And for all of you watching at home, today is going to be a fantastic day. I think that's true every time we gather together, but let me tell you why today is going to be really special. Several things we want to celebrate today. For starters, today is Juneteenth. Uh, you may know this, but on January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. Unfortunately, that news did not reach all the slaves until it showed up June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas. And so today is a day that we want to celebrate the freedom that was promised while also recommitting ourselves to working for that freedom to be actualized. We know that Jesus said we should pray that may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We know in the kingdom of heaven, everyone, because they're created in the image of God, everyone is valued as a son or a daughter of God. And we want to work towards that here at Epic Church. Today is also Father's Day. So all of you dads, be honored today. You can clap for the dads. Ladies, come on. And I want to say a few things about that. First of all, um, if you have a father that you're grateful for, make sure you express that. I would encourage you to express that to God in Thanksgiving, but also to your father if he's still alive. If you don't have that in a biological father, perhaps you have that in a spiritual father. Paul wrote that he had become a spiritual father. And he said, we don't have a lot of spiritual fathers, but I want you to know if you don't have that, you can actually find that in the Epic community. There are a great group of men that um, I can recommend and even would love to have the privilege of being a spiritual father to you all as well as the lead pastor of this church. And uh, for all of the men today, we celebrate you. And for those of you 18 and up, we have a brand new gift, a, an Epic Church camping mug that we've never given away until today. So make sure if you're in the band and you're 18 and up, Make sure that you grab one of these super cool, I don't even have mine yet until today, um, but men, we honor you. We know that uh, there's a high calling on our lives as men, and we know uh, ladies do so much, and we honor them on Mother's Day and other times throughout the year, but it's, it's the men in our church also who are so crucial, so thank you for the role that you play as leaders and as men. And then today is really fun for me. I've got a few friends going to be leading the way for us today. For starters, we have Chris and Mary Cutie leading worship with us today. Chris and Mary are global worship pastors at Lake Point Church in the Dallas, Texas area, multiple campuses there. Before that, Chris was a worship pastor at Life Church with Craig Rochelle, one of the great influential churches in our nation. And um, love what these guys are doing. They're writing music, producing it, leading there, and willing to spend a weekend with us here in San Francisco. And then they're going to lead us in musical worship. And then after that, we have Mark Batterson in the house speaking to us. Mark is someone for a long time I only learned from from afar. Um, books like Circle Maker and one of the other 20, I don't know, plus whatever books you've written, Mark. And over the last few years, Mark's become a friend to me. And one of the things about all of these guys that will be on stage that you, I think, will enjoy their leadership today, um, sometimes you wonder, like, when I see them on stage, are, are, are they like that at all or close to that in person? And I want to tell you that all of the people leading today, they're even better off the stage than they are on the stage. And those are the sort of character people we're looking for here. We do not entrust this church just to anybody. So I want you to know that you're in good hands today. Mark Pastors, planted in Pastors National Community Church in our nation's capital. Um, before I ever saw 414 Brandon Street with Will Marazza, the week prior to that, I just so happened, coincidentally, a trip that I was supposed to take in 2020, I just so happened to be in D.C. with Mark and seeing uh, how they had built out an entire city block. And so, man, thank you for the vision that you poured into me and... I don't think it's a surprise that, uh, that God would bring you here and bring me there and in between show us this building. So we're grateful to hear from you today. Would you pray with me whether you're at home or right here in the house? It's going to be a fantastic day. God, we welcome your presence. Holy Spirit, we believe that you love us. We believe that with your power, all things are possible. We believe that you can give us truths that will set us free. And we honor you today. Right here in the middle of the summer and everything kind of going crazy in our world, economic fallout and still COVID lingering and uh, canceled vacations and all of the things that are present, we lift our eyes to you. God, today we just reflect on that first Peter 5. We, uh, we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, knowing that in due time you will lift us up. We cast all of our anxieties upon you because you care for us. And we want to run the race today. We want to take that Hebrews 12, 2 posture. We want to fix our eyes on Jesus. 
Jesus, you told us that if we would not run after all of the things, but if we would seek first you, your kingdom, your righteousness, everything else you would be pleased to give us as well. And so we want to focus our mind's attention and we want to give our heart's affection to you today. Come and move in power in Christ's name. Amen. Come on, let's give them praise, Epic Church. It's good to be in the house of God today where we firmly believe that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. His presence is among us. He is here. And so with our voices lifted to heaven, we give Him praise above all things. So let's lift our voices to heaven. Sing of His goodness, for He deserves it all.
there seemed to be no way. And that love is stirring us back to life. We sing of that new life today.
sons and daughters he has made us new we were once prisoners beggars but now we have been made new redeemed called sons and daughters a royal priesthood set apart we believe that that same God can revive and bring light to the darkest of places maybe it's in the midst of your home that you're asking for a revival in the midst of a heart of a loved one a friend would these prayers of faith that we sing to heaven not just be words on a screen or words that we recite, but the very belief in our heart that God can and He will, that His Spirit, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is alive today. He can revive this, this city. He can revive every part that we see to think is unredeemable, but God can. God can. So in faith today, just lift your prayers of faith to heaven. Say, God, let your Holy Spirit pour out. Use me to shine your light. You have called me a city on a hill to testify the truth that revival is possible. In your own way today, just, just speak to him. Believe in faith that he can.
so good to us fall. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you are a good, good Father. Thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your forgiveness that made a way for us to be with you for all of eternity in heaven. Thank you for your presence that is here with us now. Father, we want to meet with you. We want to hear from you. So we open our ears. We open up our hearts for the word you have for us today. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Guys, you can go ahead and be seated. morning epic uh i don't know about you i'm still singing the last song there is a good good father can i tell you if we had better hearing here here's what i think we would hear we would hear a heavenly father say this is my beloved son this is my beloved daughter and who am i who i am well pleased there's a god who loves you surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. You're here in person. You're online. Aren't you grateful for a God who cannot give up on us? And and I'll tell you this. As an earthly father who falls short, I'm so grateful that there is a heavenly father who fills that gap. And so praise God. What a joy to gather on a Father's Day, uh, I will say, for the record, yeah, I pastor a church in D.C. I love doing that. Uh, written a couple of books. Love doing that. At the end of the day, I want to be famous in my home. Success is when those who know you best respect you most. And so I love being a, a dad uh, to my kids, uh, our three kids. Love being a husband to my wife. And what a joy Uh, To have friends in the kingdom like Ben and Shauna, your pastors are incredible. Can I just say that for the record? Uh, I I was here pre-COVID, and I don't know if that was three years or 30 years ago. That was a long, that was a whole universe ago. I don't know about the multiverse, but it feels a little bit like that sometimes. Uh, These last couple of years, we went a year and two weeks in D.C. where we couldn't gather by government. Matt, you went even longer, but what a joy to, uh, in the kingdom, have friends. And you guys took us to a ball game at Oracle Park, and uh, I love gifted leaders who are down to earth, and that's who leads this church. And so I want to honor you and say thank you. Uh, Joy to have this friendship. And I will say, uh, we're in the middle of a miracle in D.C. Uh, Property values there, uh, not unlike here, uh, trying to find a property where we might have a church home. Uh, Felt like, God, this is going to take at least a, a minor miracle. But the Lord gave us a city block, and uh, it's, a, it's a miracle story I won't share. But I have been believing with this church from the day that I heard about the vision to this home campaign, which so many of you are part of. Can I, as someone just coming in from the outside, say thank you for putting your heart and soul into this? And I knew about those prayer walks. I knew that when the first contract fell through, it was on a good Friday, and, and I said, because we were texting back and forth, I, I said, I know what happens after Good Friday. <laughs> Give it a few days, because sometimes that, see, we all want a miracle, we just don't want to be in a situation that necessitates one. But you can't have one without the other. And so I believe that this church is in the middle of a miracle I got to see that piece of property, and I can see it. When you look through eyes of faith, 
And so can I just encourage you? Uh, I believe the best is yet to come for Epic Church. I'm so excited where God is leading you, and it's a joy uh, for me to be here this weekend. And so why don't we uh, get into God's Word? We're, we're in a, a series called Moving Forward, and, and I think this is one of those messages. My hunch is there's a few of us that are stuck. In fact, let's just level the playing field. Is there anybody here that hasn't at some point gotten stuck relationally, emotionally, spiritually? Something happens, and I'm just, mm, I'm either maintaining the status quo or there's not a whole lot of forward progress. I, I think this message is going to set some of us free. And so why don't you grab a Bible? You can meet me in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 22. We'll get there in just a moment, I want to pray for us as we get into God's word and uh, trust the Holy Spirit to speak to us. Lord, thank you. Uh, we believe you order our footsteps. You prepare good works in advance. And so, Lord, I'm trusting that uh, you're going to do something in our hearts and minds that this, this is going to be a day when decades happen, that this is going to be a day that a little thing becomes a big thing. Faith is taking the first step before God reveals the second step. And Lord, I pray that for those of us uh, in person, online. I pray that for Epic Church, and I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I better say one more thing. I, I know that the farther away from home you are, the more of an expert you are. <laughs> That's why I love traveling and sp speaking, but I want you to know that I, I'm, uh, I'm just a guy who's trying to figure out how to be a husband to my wife and a father to my kids and a pastor to our church, and I have my fair share of issues and challenges just like you. And, uh, and I'll also just throw this one in for free. Uh, I've also learned as a former college basketball player that the older you get, the better you were. I'm just throwing that one in there. Just, uh, I, this feels like family to me. And, and so we're going to have a family talk, and I'm excited for what the Lord's going to do. Around the turn of the 19th century, a Russian uh, physician named Ivan Pavlov did some experiments with dogs. This may ring a bell, pun intended, uh, a high school class. Uh, you, you remember that dogs naturally salivate to food. Well, Pavlov wanted to see if he could condition those dogs with a ringing bell and then feed them their food. And eventually, you know what happened, that the ringing bell, without the uh, food caused the dogs to salivate, and Pavlov referred to this learned relationship as a conditioned reflex. C can you say that with me? Conditioned reflex. All right, I want you to hold that thought. We're going to jump into this story, uh, Luke chapter 22, and you'll find it uh, on the screen. Here we go. And, and by the way, Last Supper, Garden of Gethsemane. This is the night before the crucifixion. And so the plot is thickening. And here's where we pick it up. It says, then seizing him, they led him away right after this betrayal by Judas. And they took him into the house of the high priest. And Peter followed at a distance. And let's be honest, we give Peter a hard time for following at a distance. But he's the only one who got close enough to get caught right? And so he's following, and he, here's what happens. And, and when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. Now, a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. 
And about an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Now, by the way, this is interesting to me because there were two different dialects. You had a Judean dialect, a Galilean dialect, and Peter's accent here betrays him. And so basically, they're saying, you're not from here. You're not one of us. And I almost wonder if that accent produced a little bit of implicit bias. Now, I'm just kind of digging a little bit deeper right here. And uh, it almost seems like Peter's denial is a little bit of a re reaction to some discrimination that's happening. I'm just putting it out there. This is a real story about real people with real issues. And so uh, he denies it. And uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking and just as Jesus had prophesied, the rooster crowed. And we're going to stop right there. Uh, and I'll pick it up in a second. I, I was reading this a few years ago, and I've read this story many times like you have. A and I I'll be honest, I had a uh, Pavlovian thought. I wonder if a rooster crowing caused a twinge of guilt in Peter. Well, what, 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 huh? Stick with me. Have you ever noticed how sights and sounds and smells can produce reactions? It can jog the memory. This is going to sound super sentimental, but when I catch a whiff of lilacs, lilacs, I am transported through time and space to my grandparents' backyard in Fridley, Minnesota, and I'm five years old all over again. You can think about smells and sights and sounds that transport you, right, right? And so I think Peter, when he hears this rooster crowing, come on, it's a reminder of his greatest failure. So he, here's what I would suggest. To one degree or another, all of us are Pavlovian. Uh, we've been consciously, subconsciously conditioned our entire lives, and much of our behavior is dictated by these conditioned Reflexes. Now, some of them are as normal and natural as a blush. I mean, some can be as destructive as self-medicating or self-injury. -in but here's what I would say. We are more conditioned than we realize. We have this elaborate repertoire of adaptive strategies, of defense mechanisms, of coping mechanisms. And I think what we have to realize is that we can be conditioned by our circumstances, but maybe, just maybe, there is a God who wants to recondition those reflexes with his grace. That's the big idea today because I think some of us get stuck. There's trauma. We're triggered by this or that or the other thing. Something happens that gets us stuck in a moment and we can't get out of it. I think someone wrote a song like that. Um, so it may seem like I'm kind of making a big deal about nothing, a rooster's crow, but you've got to understand this setting. Here we are in San Francisco, and San Francisco, my guess, is a lot like Washington, D.C., where I live. The rooster population is zero, okay? Uh, we wake up where I am to sirens and garbage trucks and Gunfire or fireworks, we're not sure which, but, but the other night it was fireworks because someone won an NBA championship. That's what I'm talking about. Hey, this is totally random and it just came to mind, but this is, can I just share kind of a fun little, fun little fact? Uh, before that first championship, I think it was the first championship, um, I, I think uh, uh, 10 out of 12 players went through the Draw the Circle of the 40-Day Prayer Challenge, a book I wrote many, many, many years ago. And they actually read that book during that championship season. I'm not saying that's why they won. <laughs> but I'm not saying it's not either, okay? Uh, just having a little bit, of, little bit of fun. And so I think my appreciation for this story um, went way up when many years ago, uh, we went on a missions trip to the Galapagos. It's this ar archipelago of islands off the coast of Ecuador. And 
I, I, I woke up around 4 a.m. to what must have been thousands of roosters right outside my window, and there's no snooze button on these roosters. I'm, what is happening? It was the most rude awakening I've ever gotten, and, uh, and it made me appreciate this story because what I'm getting at is this. Every morning, Peter woke up to a rooster's crow, and every morning, it's like, I'm going to remind you of everything you've done wrong over and over and over again. The, the enemy is predictable. We have game film going back to the Garden of Eden. And one of his monikers is the accuser of the brethren. In other words, I'm going to try to remind you of everything you've done wrong over and over and over again so that you are so focused on past mistakes that there's nothing left over to give to future dreams. I, I, I'm going to kind of... He doesn't just prowl like a roaring lion. I would suggest he crows like a rooster. Are we all in this together? Okay. And so Jesus came to recondition our reflexes. And, and you might be thinking, you know, Pastor Mark, give me, give me chapter and verse. I'll give you the Sermon on the Mount. Because here's a thought, if you're taking notes, you can jot this down. It's much easier to act like a Christian than it is to react like one. And so it's our reactions that really reveal what is happening in our hearts, in our minds. When you look at this Sermon on the Mount, which is genius, it's, I think it's 1,014 words. Like it's, it's a shorter sermon than what I'll preach today. And yet somehow Jesus in one Sermon on the Mount gives us this most counterintuitive, countercultural ethic that turns the world upside down. Now theologians call them six antitheses. I would call them six counter habits. But, but here they are. L love your enemies. Wow. Okay, seriously, we're going to start there? See, see, we think that love your neighbor is the radical idea. No, 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 no. Love your enemies is the radical piece. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who curse you. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile and give the shirt off of your back. It seems to me like Jesus is reconditioned. Because when people hate on me. And, and I know it's not just D.C. I know it happens here. There's a lot of baiting and trolling and canceling. Yes, here too, here? Yes, truth, okay. Um, my natural reaction, if someone slaps me, come on. Like, I want to I wanna slap back. In fact, if there's any unsanctified part of my life, it's when I'm driving. I'm just going to say the good news is we didn't even rent a car here this weekend, so I'm, I'm pretty sanctified this weekend. But come on, even when someone cuts you off, isn't it crazy how we react and overreact? Here's where I want to get in your business a little bit because I've been talking long enough um, that, that I think I can do that because I'm not doing us any favors if I don't. I think the job of the pastor is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. So I would say pay careful attention to your reactions, but I would push it a little bit further and say pay, pay careful attention to your overreactions. You, ha you ever have someone like just like explode over something that was so little? Like what just happened? I'll tell you what happened. There's something in their past that they haven't dealt with. Because hurt people hurt people. And what happens is we begin to project our pain on other people. And so where there is an overreaction, there's usually some deep hurt. And by the way, that gives me grace and empathy because everybody's fighting a battle that we know nothing about. And so instead of just, I'm going to react in kind, Jesus elevates the game and says, watch this. Greatest of all, servant of all, 
first shall be last, last shall be first. I mean, this, this stuff right here, and, and by the way, if you really want to confuse someone, someone who has just cursed you, and I, I could mean that literally or figuratively, bless the person who curses you and watch the confusion on their face. That's what God has called us to. And so the grace of God enables us to not just react to the pain, to the hurt, to the circumstances, but actually elevate and proact and love on people who are hating on us. Is this easy? Are you kidding me? Do you ever get really, really... I don't know if you ever... It doesn't come naturally. This is supernatural. In my experience, there are two things that tend to result in overreactions. And, and this is a guy that I think it was two weeks ago, uh, right in front of our church, was pulled over and should have gotten a ticket, but I didn't, okay? Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm still working on things a little, a little bit. Was that too much information? <laughs> You're going to keep listening to me? Okay. Um, when I overreact, it tends to be one of two things, and you tell me if this is your experience. It's an unsanctified ego. My pride gets injured. There's something that, mm, and I go into defense mechanism mode, or it's unforgiveness. And that unforgiveness, that seed of bitterness becomes an issue that really becomes. And so let's just cut to the chase. Here's the practical takeaway this weekend. I think it's, you should be praying for the people you love, yes? You should also be praying for the people that you love less, okay? The EGR, extra grace required people, because I have learned that if I'm praying for the people that maybe get under my skin a little bit or are causing this ego or this reaction, maybe even something they've done to hurt me, something I need to forgive. The only way for me to handle that is to pray for them. And when I do that, now I'm able to look them in the eye and love them. All right, I want to I wanna dive back into the story uh, right here. No, notice what happens. Rooster crows, and uh, I think we have the, the verse. Th then the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. In my experience, the hardest person to forgive is me. And I think Jesus knows that, that Peter's going to get down on Peter, that, that Peter might give up on Peter. And so what does he do? It's a beautiful subtext here in the story. It says Jesus looks straight at him. Notice he doesn't say anything to Peter. Well, well so what? Well, if he had said something, there goes Peter's alibi, and Peter is on a cross with him. Are you tracking with me? He would have been calling him out, but he doesn't say anything. It says he just looked at him. I, I wish we had the, the uh, video of this moment, because what, what kind of look does Jesus give Peter? Now, I, I think it was A.W. Tozer who said, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you? Let, let that land for a second. So when you close your eyes and you envision God, and this is a little bit of anthropomorphism, but what expression is on his face? I, I, I would suggest it's this loving, in fact, I, I think God has smile lines. And, and if you see a God who's kind of retracting and a little standoffish. I, I don't think you have fully read the Gospels or God's progressive revelation of himself, that you, you can run from God your whole life. We just sang about it. You, you can, the goodness of God, you can run from God your whole life, and here's what you will discover. If you will turn around 
you're going to find a God who is there with arms wide open, loving and embracing. It's who he is. It's the heart of God. There's a God who cannot give up on us. And so I don't think Jesus is giving him the evil eye. I don't think, this, you know, I got my eye on you kind of like waiting. No, I, I think Jesus is like, lock eyes with me. Lock eyes with me. I'm going to do this with a few of you. Uh, and and even, even online, there's a second where when you lock eyes with someone, th- there's something powerful that happens, even, even at a distance. Um, ha- have you, as a parent, found that w- when you need your kids to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, what, what do you tell them? L- look me in the eye, because it's a lot harder to lie if they're looking you in the eye. And, and some of you, I can tell, you, you, you got that special someone with you today, and you love them. You don't even need to say anything. You just can stare in each other's eyes, right? You can tell who, who is that newly in love person. They just kind of gaze into each other's eyes because, you know, they get lost in each other's eyes. There's something powerful about eye contact. Where, where I'm going with this is I almost feel like Jesus is saying with his eyes, I'm not giving up on you. Come on, lock eyes with me. I I can't give up on you. It's going to be okay. We're going to get to the other side of this. It's going to get worse before it gets better. I'm going to end up on a cross, but don't give up. Don't give up. Because that third day, I'm going to rise again, and then relationship is going to get reconciled. I hope you can see a God who is locking eyes with you today, a God who will not give up on you. Now, I want to fast forward to John's gospel. What, what happens? What happens? Well, the resurrection happens, which changes everything. And then Jesus appears to the disciples in a multiplicity of ways and settings. But one of those is on the, the Sea of Galilee. And I, and I love the account in John's gospel, John 21, verse 3. And I'm going to kind of go full circle here. Peter says, uh, I'm going out to fish. And and we think recreationally because that's what most of us fish for. But but Peter, I think, is speaking occupationally. Would that be fair? I mean, he was a fisherman before he was a disciple. And so part of me thinks, because I know my human nature, that sometimes when I make a mistake, I just want to throw the whole towel in. And, and the enemy, it's one of his tactics that like one little mistake, will just forget about it. I'm going to go back to my old way of life. I, I think what Peter is saying here is, I think my career as a disciple might be over with. And that's probably a fair assessment if you're dealing with anybody besides Jesus. And, and so Peter goes out to fish, and I, I love what happened. They don't catch a thing all night. And then this is the classic, you know, the non-fisherman from the shore says, try the other side of the boat, which is hilarious, because the boats were seven and a half feet wide. Like, do you really think the fish are hiding on the other side of the boat? I don't think so. But credit to the disciples who actually try it. They catch 153 fish, and there's this beautiful moment where Peter knows that he knows that this must be Jesus. And he jumps out of the boat. He swims to shore. And I just have to say this. You gotta love a God who grills out. Can I just say that? Because there is grilled fish waiting for the disciples. And then after he fills their stomachs, after a long night of fishing, Jesus pulls Peter aside. And I wonder if Jesus would pull a few of us aside. And he asked him a question. Do you love me more than these? Now, scholars love to debate about, well, what exactly are we talking about here? And and there's a few theories, you know, one of them being the, like, do you love me more than your old occupation? You know, that would be one translation. I'm not so concerned about that nuance. What what I'm wondering today is, do you love him more than the thing you love the most? 
He wants your heart. Because he loves you and he wants that love in return. But he doesn't ask it once or twice. Three times, Jesus says, do you love me more than these? Now, if you go and look at it, you'll see that it says Peter was grieved. Peter was hurt. I want to be really careful here because I'm not giving us a license to hurt people. But I think sometimes we're so afraid of hurting people that we let them hurt themselves. We aren't really doing anybody any favor. What we need to do is speak the truth in love. L love is grace plus truth. Grace means I'll forgive you no matter what. Truth means I'll be honest with you no matter what. Why in the world would Jesus ask three times? Well, maybe, just maybe, Jesus knew something about Condition reflexes before Ivan Pavlov came along. And I love this moment. It's almost like three denials. We're, we're going to reconcile this three times. We're, we're not going to leave anything under the carpet. We're going to get it out in the open, and we're going to get it right. Now, last observation, and we're almost done. W when does it happen? When does it happen? Uh, verse 4. Early... In the morning, can, can I just ask a question? When do roosters crow? Do you see what's happening here? It's almost like Jesus is saying, I'm going to take this rooster's crow that, that would produce guilt and remind you of what you've done wrong, your greatest failure, but I'm going to rewrite the narrative. And I'm going to bring you back to a moment where I reconciled and recommissioned and gave you a new lease on life and leadership. What an incredible moment as Jesus comes full circle. What a, what a beautiful moment of love and grace. I'm going to share this really quickly, but uh, regret is something that's real. I, there's no one here that doesn't have a regret of some kind. Uh, Peter certainly would have regretted th this moment in a sense of, man, I wish I hadn't made the mistake in the first place. What, what do you do with those regrets? By, by the way, uh, we have uh, re regrets, action regrets, things that we've done that we wish we hadn't done. Theologically, that would be called a sin of commission. But then there are inaction regrets. And those are things that woulda, coulda, shoulda done, opportunities left on the table that you're left with a what if. What's interesting is that uh, research has found that, you know, in the short term, we tend to regret our actions because those are the painful things that we feel and, and sense. But over the long haul, 84% of our regrets are inaction regrets. It's the things, the opportunities that, man, we could have done that. What if? What, what does Peter do with his regret. You, you go to the end of the story, and it's pretty amazing because 11 out of the 12 disciples are martyred. And listen, John, John survived a cauldron of boiling oil, lands on the Isle of Patmos and writes the book of Revelation, but he scarred the rest of his life. 11 of the 12 are martyred, Peter being one of them. You, you get to the end of his life, and he is no longer denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because when you've encountered a risen Savior, it changes everything. And now he says, I'm not even worthy to be crucified the way that my Savior was. According to church tradition, Peter is crucified upside down. What kind of person says, crucify me upside down because I'm not worthy? I'll tell you, someone, someone who's reflexes have been reconditioned by the grace of God. I don't know what triggers you. I don't know what produces those feelings of guilt. I don't know where the ego might be unsanctified. I don't know where there might be unforgiveness. But all of that to say this, if we're going to move forward, in our lives personally, in our life corporately as a church, man, we need to come to Jesus moment. And, and I'm not just talking about a first step of faith. 
was a couple of months ago, and, and I'll try to land the plane with this, that I, I, I wake up one morning, and I'm not in a great place. I'm struggling emotionally and spiritually, and I'll, I'll tell you something that isn't going to be um, real revelatory. Leadership the last couple of years has been hard, and I don't care what you lead in part because of the polarization. I'm in D.C. Everything is politicized. Throw in a COVID uh, pandemic, and, and it's been hard, hard to lead. But, but I, I, I woke up that morning. was like, I probably need to get a little bit of help. And so uh, I started seeing a counselor. By, by the way, that, that's, that might be your takeaway, that you need someone to, to process some of what you're feeling. Uh, and so... I uh, went to that counselor, and he took me through this exercise, and it was a forgiveness exercise. Is there anyone or anything that you need to forgive? And, and this is where you might be tempted, sermon's almost over, um, and, uh, and we're out of here. You start thinking about what you're getting for brunch, but I want you to lock in for a second, because my hunch is that there are all of us, there's one or two or three people, things that... We, we got to get this reconciled before God. And you know what I realized? I thought that that exercise would take a few minutes. A few hours later, like, oh, Lord, I didn't know that there was this much bitterness. I didn't know I had taken offense at this thing, and it was affecting the way that I was leading and loving. And I, I needed to deal with it. And I'll tell you what, when I dealt with it, I felt 100 pounds lighter. It was like this moment where I'm just not going to live in the guilt of unforgiveness. I'm going to keep going back to the foot of the cross and let Jesus do what he does. I don't think there's a day where I don't need the unmeasured grace of God. Jerry Bridges said it this way, and this might be a, a final uh, thought. He said, our worst days are never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace. Aren't you grateful for that? And our best days are never so good that we are beyond the need of God's grace. Every day is a day of relating to God on the basis of his grace alone. Yeah, yeah but, but Mark, I don't deserve it. That's the whole point. <laughs> By definition, Grace is the undeserved, unmerited favor of God. And it's available to each and every one of us. And good news, it's sufficient. His grace is sufficient. And when we experience that grace, we can move into the future that God has for us in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite the worship team to come. I want to invite you to stand. You're here and uh, online. You can posture yourself however you want to, um, but I wonder if we could just take a moment as you stand and as our worship team comes, if I can pray for you. And I, I want to pray in a way that involves a little bit of body posture, if that's okay. I love the way that the Quakers would pray with hands face down, kind of symbolizing anything that they needed to let go. There are some things that we need to let go and let God, amen? And then they would turn their hands over, and we'll do this in a moment. They would turn their hands over, and just in this posture of receptivity, just receive the grace of God. Can, can I share some good news today before we pray this prayer? Lamentation says that his mercies are new every morning. Do, do you know that that word new in the Hebrew language doesn't just mean again and again and again, which would be amazing. I mean, that's amazing that God's mercy shop is never closed. That's amazing. But, but the word in Hebrew has a nuance and it means different. In other words, the mercy you receive today is different than yesterday than the day before. Pastor Ben, Pastor Will, I'll just pick on you. The mercy that God's showing me today is different than the mercy he's showing you because it has your fingerprint. It has your fingerprint. Everybody in the house, everybody online, this is such a profound thing that there's a God whose mercy never runs out and it as, is as custom tailored to your need as anything you'll ever experience. 
And it's available today in this moment. And so with hands face down, Lord, here we are on a Father's Day, June of 2022. And Lord, I, I don't know all the individual circumstances, but I know that even at 4.30 this morning, I, I woke up with a thought, and that thought <laughs> was a frustration, and that frustration needed to be turned into a prayer. Isn't that something? That even at 4.30 this morning, I knew, God, I need your mercy. I need your grace to recondition my reflexes, to recondition my heart and my mind. And so, Lord, I pray today, someone walked in today, and there's something that happened 17 years ago. And you can't change the past. But you can invite God's grace into it. Would you give us the courage, Lord? Because I try to manipulate, I try to control, I want to fix it myself, but there's some things I can't fix. But you can, and so I let go. I let go. And I turn my hands over right now. And Lord, in a posture of receptivity, ready for whatever it is that you want to do in each and every one of us. I pray, God, that you would restore the joy of our salvation. I, I pray that you would give peace that passes understanding, that, God, you would flood our heart and souls today with your grace, and that that grace would begin to even reshape the synapses in our mind, that, Lord, even at the level of the amygdala or the basal ganglia, e even in the very inner parts of our heart and mind, oh God, do a miracle in those places as we invite your grace to recondition all that we are. In Jesus' name, would you add an amen right there? Amen. Hey, by faith, I really believe, and, and it doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a little bit of work, right? You got to still do the work, not for that salvation, not for that forgiveness, not for that grace, but from grace. Now, I go to work and believe that God is going to change me into his image. Amen? Hey, we're going to worship the Lord as we do. Just open your hearts, love this song, and, and this might be a moment. Uh, I think king, king in my heart, is that right? I mean, I, I would ask the question, point blank. Because Jesus changes the game. I mean, that's how Peter is changed. He's the key to the whole equation. Um, have you surrendered your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And, and that sounds very like, well, what does that mean? I mean, past, present, future. I mean, time, talent, treasure. I mean, heart, soul, mind, and strength. I mean, all of me. I give it to all of you. And if you want to do that today, maybe this song is a prayer that you want to pray in response to what God is doing in your heart. Let's worship the Lord together.
just declare one more time with your voice. Declare, God, you are good with confidence, with faith, with boldness. God, you are good. Despite what may be going on in our lives, the circumstances, you are good. You will never let us down. You will never let us down. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, amen. Epic Church, you can go ahead and have a seat for what, just one more moment. Can we just start by thanking our guests for being with us today? Chris and Mary, thank you, and the rest of the team for leading us in worship. Pastor Mark, thank you for that message. Thank you for helping us move forward. Thank you for helping us get unstuck. I just keep thinking through what that gaze from Jesus must have been like towards Peter. And Epic Family, God's loving gaze has been upon you today, has been upon our church, and not just today, but in the past. You know, his loving gaze is always on us, always on us, because he cares for us, because he loves us. I believe the, the key thing is to be aware of it and to lean into it and to trust in it and keep moving forward. I want to tell you about one area of our church where we just see God's hand, his gaze upon it, and it's with our middle school and high school students. God is doing just some amazing things with that group. They meet at 11 o'clock in the Connection Center, and Anthony and Krista and the leadership team have just been investing and pouring into these young people. And uh, every month, of, I feel like every month we're seeing new kids come, get plugged in. And I don't need to tell you this, but our students, they know how to have fun. Not only are they growing in their faith, but these kids know how to have fun. A couple of weeks ago, they had this quarterly event that they do, a student night, where they come together on a Friday night for food, for uh, games, worship, and a teaching. And they just had a blast. I want you to check out this video to see what goes down on those events. Isn't that awesome? I, I, I was here at that event. My wife and I were here. We were actually the ones making those cool drinks. So I could tell you, non-alcoholic, but sh super sugary, okay? But it was a lot of, and I was like, man, this is just so cool. And anyway, this summer, our kids and students, they're going to camp. Um, every Thursday evening, our students are hanging out in that hangout room that we built out for them at 400 Second Street. And so if you know of a, a child that's in middle school or in high school, make sure that they are a part of it. You'll see pictures of that space. Also in that uh, building, 400 Second Street, is our prayer room. So join us Thursday mornings for prayer. And I just got to say that it's because of your generosity that we are able to invest in a great way in the next generation, that we are able to do all these things that we are doing, these student nights, for them to go to camp, this hangout room. And I'm telling you, I was just sitting there with my son, my 12-year-old son, just thinking through what I'm about to say to you and just thank you for your generosity. And it's personal for me. Because the most important thing for me as a father, on this Father's Day, you know, we get honored and we get recognized, which is great, but I'm also re reminded of my responsibility to lead him to come to know Christ and for him to be um, used as a vessel for Jesus to make an impact in this world. That's my greatest calling as a dad, and I'm thankful to have young men and women pouring into my son and pouring into the next generation because it's making a difference. And I thank you for your generosity because it's making a difference. So this means the world to us. So, And if you would like to join us in this great work to invest, to help the young people orient their entire lives around Jesus, you can join us in that. You can follow one of the prompts on the screen. And lastly, I just want to share with those of you who are new, 
for he, who are here for the first time, we're so glad that you're with us today. We believe that this is a place that you can call home. We believe this is a place where you can belong and grow in your faith. And one of the things that we would love to do is to help you get connected to this community. We believe that is one of the best decisions that you can make. And one great way for us to assist you in that is to ask you at this time, if you will, grab that Connect card, which is right in front of you, begin to fill it out. And then after our gathering, we'll just dismiss in a moment here. You can bring it to our next steps area, which is just to the right of the staircase. And there, guys, we just want to say hi to you, and we want to give you a gift as another way of saying thank you so much for being with us today. We also want to invite you and anyone who is fairly new to Epic to join us at our Next Steps Lunch, which is taking place on July 24th. At this event, we want to feed you. We want to just briefly share with you what it means to be a part of this Epic community. You'll meet some of our pastors. You'll meet other people who are new to Epic, and you'll also meet some of our leaders. You're not going to want to miss out. You can sign up for that event on that Connect card as well. Epic family, what a great day, right? It's been a beautiful day. I'm going to ask you to just stand as I say a blessing over us today. Epic family, may the Lord bless you. May his favor be with you. May the Lord continue to just move you forward, knowing that you are loved, knowing that his grace is with you, knowing that his grace is for you. And may you walk in that throughout this week. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for joining us on the Epic Church live stream. We hope that you found today's message encouraging and helpful in your faith. If you'd like to learn more, we invite you to visit epicsf.com, the Epic SF app, and our social media channels where you can watch past messages and keep up with everything that God is doing in and throughout our community right here in downtown San Francisco. Wherever you're joining us from, we hope that you have a great rest of your day and that we'll see you again next time.